I have my notes on my phone too, so I don't forget anything uh, about this wonderful woman that you are going to hear tonight and you are not going to want to leave, I promise you. I first met our speaker, Kelly, over 12 years ago. She was a short-term missionary sent to Grand Cayman, and I was an intern worship leader at the time at Chapel Church of God on Walker's Road. We met after a Sunday and pretty much instantly knew that we had one thing in common, a heart for worship, and specifically through music. And we found ourselves singing together and going to the beach quite often. Although I quickly realized that there was something different about Kelly. She was set apart from any other woman that I'd ever met. She had a boldness that was almost intimidating at first, but as I got to know her, I saw a side that amazed me about Kelly. She was able to hear from the Holy Spirit in a way that I had never experienced or seen before. Throughout my life, Kelly has been a huge pillar of faith for me. In my darkest moments, she, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, almost literally brought me back to life by speaking truth, sharing tools, and shedding light in areas of my life where, it needed, where I needed to come out of hiding. Kelly is a world changer. She listens to the Holy Spirit for his next assignment and then acts in obedience. She has traveled to over 16 countries of the world on assignment from God, specifically. She has prayed and seen the dead literally raised before her eyes. She has led people to Christ, including her own father. She has helped the bound find complete restoration. She walks the talk and knows that her identity comes from the creator of the universe, and she is rooted in him. Everyone, I would like to introduce my friend and our speaker tonight, Ms. Kelly Surratt. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Um, two things really quick. I want to honor Felix and Dorothy. Um, today, when I was meditating, one of the things that the Lord brought to my heart was that those who are obedient and willing shall eat of the good of the land. And I want to honor you guys because you're obedient. You said yes, but you could have just said yes. You said yes with gladness and willingness means to gladly, ungrudgingly do something. And you may have to work through moments, but he trusts you. To whom much is given, much is required. And it's the willingness that will keep you. It's the obedience plus the willingness. And so I just speak over you two, and I bless you both, that in Jesus' name, that you will eat of the good of the land, of this land and the spirit and the natural, because of your obedience and your willingness to say yes to the call on your life. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to get started. And I believe the Lord has sent me here on assignment. He sent me, Sarah was speaking, um, to about 14 countries, but prophesying because there's two more coming, so yes. <laughs> um, but on assignment for him. Because how many of us know right now, one of the things that Vanessa, so I keep, I keep in the flow of Journey Online, um, because I do, this is home away from home for me in a lot of ways. This country in Guatemala, I was a missionary here for a year, 12 years ago, um, and grew to, to really love the island and love the people. And so in that, one of the things that I believe that the Lord has to do when he sends people back into a place is because he's ready to move. It's because he's ready to shift. And so I want you guys all to say the word shift. Because Vanessa, I watched and I heard the Lord use you to prophesy over this church that it is a prophetic church. And I heard your pastor say that Carrying the heart of God is what he's getting a revelation of what it means to be a prophetic church. And so I believe I came in to just tag team, boom, boom, and say to you guys, unveiled. I want everybody to say that word, unveiled. unveiled. Okay, so I'm going to teach and I'm going to give testimony at the same time. So just flow with me. Because I believe that in order for this to be a church that carries the heart of God, you must have the capacity to live unveiled. So, let's get a definition of the word unveiled. If you have notes, if you want to take notes, if you have your phone, I highly suggest you take some notes. So, the word unveiled, therefore it is imperative to impact this word because it means to reveal, to unveil truth, to make public. So, that's a pretty powerful combination of words. I'm going to take us to some scriptures if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Colossians 2.15, and I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. Your pastor's actually turned me on to that translation. I was listening to y'all do a tag team. I was like, yes, this translation. 
Um, yes, and so I want to read that. Colossians 2, 15. And it says, Then Jesus made a public spectacle, unveiled, all of the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and a power to accuse us. So they were made public and stripped of the power to do what? Accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. And so we see how Jesus unveiled the enemy, made a public display, and said, no, no, no longer do you have power and authority to accuse them. My blood draws the line. Now let's look at Hebrew chapter 10, verse 19. And I'm going to read and you can kind of catch up. It says, and now we are brothers and sisters in God's family because of the blood of Jesus. And he welcomes us to come right into the most holy sanctuary in the heavenly realm, boldly and with no hesitation. So now we see, we see first that he unveiled the enemy, and now we see that he unveiled himself to us. He made, revealed who he is. He unveiled the truth of who he is to us. And I love this next verse that I'm going to read. It's Psalm 139, 16. And it says, You saw who you created me to be before I came, became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. So you mean to tell me, when he created me, he revealed to himself everything I was going to become before I ever even knew about it? So that means every test, every trial, every dry season, every wilderness, every hard season, he already knew who was going to make me in him. Because the word of God says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in every detail of their lives. Now, I'm going to share a bit of my story tying into these scriptures. Um, my parents were married and divorced to each other twice. By the age of nine, my parents were both divorced. I grew up a daddy's girl. Inseparable. Nobody could. I mean, I'm like. My brother and him are wrestling. I'm like, I want to wrestle too. I want to, everything they did, I wanted to do with him because I just wanted to be with my father. He was a great example. To be honest, I never saw him and my mom argue in front of me ever. And so when they divorced, I was young when they divorced the first time. And I really don't remember a whole lot about it. But when I was nine, they divorced again. And I just was really, really having a hard time wrapping my head around why. Because I had never seen them argue. I had never seen anything happen. And so immediately I thought it was my fault. Well, maybe I did something and I just don't know it. And so literally every day in fifth grade almost, I threw up. Like I had to get gastroscopes because I had ulcers forming in my stomach because I had that much fear and that much anxiety about the why. And so as that happened, um, I began to kind of question. I would go to church with my aunt and I remember coming home one weekend and staying with her. And I just said to her, and this is after my parents had divorced, I don't really understand God's love for me, but I just know that he loves me and I just want to be saved. We were just in the kitchen at the, at the table just chilling. And she said, well, do you want to wait till Sunday? I said, no, can you call Reverend Falls, who's her pastor? Can you call him and let him know that I just, I want to be saved. Can you lead me in a prayer today? And so she called him. Nothing happened per se in that moment other than I know that I know that I know that Psalm 139, that whole he knew me before he ever created me peace, I can tell you that it's the blood sealed every test, every trial, every wayward moment, everything that I would go through. That moment, I believe, sealed that until I came into the fullness of revelation of he loves me for real. Um, and so I feared growing up, being a teenager, I'll be honest, I was one of those girls that was like looking for love in all the wrong places drinking, partying, being promiscuous. And during that time, what I realized about myself was it wasn't that I didn't want God, but it was that I didn't understand that he was a good father. And so out of fear of being abandoned, I backed away. Out of fear of being abandoned, I'd rather try to preserve myself because what if one day your goodness leaves? What if one day the goodness that you have for me, 
I found out that it was temporary, like my earthly father, that we're great, we're doing good, we're in close relationship, and all of a sudden you just leave. What am I going to do then? And so I chose to try to find love in every other place. And I remember when I was uh, 19, um, I was home on fall break, and I just, I remember turning on TV, and let me just preface this with saying, I had come home before that, and I was just like, Mom, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And mom was like, yeah, I know you have a 1.9 GPA right now and you're on active in probation. Like, I got the letter. And she said to me, I'm trusting God with you, but if you keep making these decisions, I can't do anything for you. But I just remember her saying distinctly in my face, she didn't, she didn't bless me. She didn't, she didn't bless me out. She just looked at me and said, I'm going to trust God with you. That's actually what I'm going to do. Um, and I was so thankful in that moment that that was her answer, hindsight 2020. And so I come home from fall break to her house because I'll be honest, it was that answer that created space for me to feel safe enough to come home even in my mess. Yeah? That's how, that's how the father is when we're prodigal children. Like, in our mess, it's that safety of, no, 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 I still see who you really are and I'm going to trust him and so you can feel safe enough to come back. And so I did. I felt safe to come home. And so I came home on break and when I came home, I was not an avid Christian TV watcher at all, but I turned the TV on and I turned it to TVN. You guys are familiar with TVN, yeah, okay. I turned it on, I turned it on TVN, um, and Jen Crouch, she was one of the founders, was talking about how God had healed her body of cancer. And immediately, and I'm telling you, I had not felt that I heard the voice of the Lord before, um, but immediately, when she said that, Holy Spirit said, just like I healed her body, I can restore your soul. And I fell over in the floor in my mom's house, and I felt a blanket, literally, I felt a blanket of love cover me. And for hours, I was in the floor weeping and weeping and weeping because he was ministering his love in such a way that it was covering the multitude of sin. The words that love covers a multitude of sin, and I felt the blanket of his presence doing that in that moment. And when I finally got up, I was crying and I called a prayer line and I was like, can you just pray for me? Because I just need wisdom to live this life. I mean, I'm passionately just in this moment. And the lady was super sweet and I just remember her soothing voice and she prayed for strength and courage. And I sat up and I said to the Lord, I said, when I was nine, I said, I received you as my savior. I said, but at 19, I want you as my Lord. I want to know you as the Lord of my life now. I want to say I give my life to you and I trust you. And I'm telling you guys, in that moment, I sat on the couch and I opened the gospel of the book of John, the gospel of John, and I read the entire thing. And for the first time, it was like he was talking to me, specifically to me. And I was like, wait, all of this is for Kelly. All of this is because of Psalm 139.16. All this is because before you formed me in my mother's womb, you truly knew me. And you had a plan and a purpose for my life. And I'm not kidding you guys. There are things in my appetite, the things that I desired, that shifted that night. And I'm 33 now. And I have never had those appetites again. And I'm telling you, his love is that powerful that it truly can, one moment in his presence, really can change everything. And so I can say to you that there are areas of my life that literally in that moment I have never looked back. In that moment there was a new creation in my thinking, in my posture, in my appetite. I went back to college that next day. I Listen y'all, I'm a loyal friend but I said I gotta dump you best friend. We just can't. We, I, have to, I have to cut you off because we're not going in the same direction. I love you and one day you'll understand. And I, <laughs> I love you and one day you'll understand. And so I did, I had to begin to trim the fat of friends. And I'm going to tell you how the Lord moves. He had me, one of the things that, that I said no more was sexual promiscuity. At 19, I said, I will wait until I'm married and you will give me a desire, Father, I believe, to trust your value for me. Because that's what he restored to me. When I understood in that moment that it's in him that I am beloved, that there is nobody else that I need until my husband to give myself away to because I valued in him. It changed things. And so for me, I ended up um, I ended up going back to school, and it's crazy because one of the things that he had me do when I went back to school was some of the guys that I had been intimate with, he said, go repent and tell them that you're sorry because you're not their wife. You took something from them that's their wives. And so I had guys like, oh, my God, what happened to her? <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus happened to me. And, you know, I, was, I have to repent for this, and I'm not kidding you. 
I had the whole basketball team come into worship services in the chapel. I had guys on the basketball team who, before, trust me, we were, they were looking at me that way, say, Kel, can you pray for me? Can you just, absolutely, yes, I can. When I left school, I had one of them say to me, my senior year, you are a different person. You literally are different than how you came here. Now, mind you, I had a 1.9 GPA for partying and drinking. I was on the dean's list after that and graduated with 3.0. That's only God. Yeah, that's only God. That's only God. And so when you talk about him restoring things, when you talk about his love reviving us and restoring us, it's real and it's true. And so for me, as I was graduating college, um, one of the things that I had wanted to really be um, honest with God about is I gave myself to you. I give my life to you. So that means... We get to do your plan and not my own. Um, I just had a breakup my senior year of college. It was kind of like, oh, I don't really know what I'm going to do now because, you know, I was planning to do this, marriage maybe. And I just said, Lord, I trust you with my life. So my pastors asked me, well, what do you think you're going to do? And I'm not kidding you. I said it joking. I said, I'm going to go work on an island with youth to be a community worker. And they were just like, okay. I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. God has a sense of humor because here's where I landed. <laughs> and so, yes, in that time period, the Lord really began to minister to me um, that my life would be one that is lived out of our intimacy so that every place that he took me would be an overflow of our relationship. And so whatever he did in me is what I would be able to give away to other people. And so, um, so I said to the Lord, okay, I said, all right, God, in the process of all this, Google was my best friend. So I just Googled, hey, what are some youth ministries, that, you know, in overseas working in islands and here in Jamaica came up with Youth for Christ and God very clearly said here. Um, and one of the things, I mean, I just, I remember in preparation to come here, just the prayers over this island for revival, for God to resurrect dead things. One of the things he spoke to me is this island is a place of refuge. It's been a financial refuge for many people from all over, but he wants that same thing in the spirit. And so I believe that the Lord is shifting things right now. And so I came here, and it's funny because you're like doing the missionary thing. <clears throat> and sometimes we get in, to be honest, the routine of thinking, um, I'm here for everybody else. But I asked God one day, sitting on the porch in West Bay, I'll never forget, God, why did you bring me here? Obviously, it's for souls and for ministry, but he said to me to fall in love with me. And I just began to cry because I was the girl who said, I am never going to work with not until 11-year-old kids because that age group is just not for me. And I came here to start an after-school program with 9 to 11-year-olds. And the Lord used those kids to teach me childlike faith. He used them to teach me to welcome the least, thank you, to welcome the least of these. He taught me so much in that time that caused my heart to be childlike towards him again. Because one of the things that happened when I, when I was afraid of the abandonment of him because of my relationship with my earthly father at that time was that the childlike faith that I that he desired for me to have was hardened and so it was this conditional if I see this from you okay I can trust you enough to like lean in but he was like I just want you to lean all in anyway just lean um and so it was crazy because here is where he started restoration between my father and I, I was um I was co-leading worship with Sarah before she went back to school at um, Church of God and um, after she left I continued to lead worship at the church for a little bit but one of the things the Lord really laid on my heart was fasting and prayer um, and so corporately we did that for a while and my father I remember right before I went home for Christmas to visit my family I was just like let's just believe for my dad's salvation like that's truly the only thing I want when I go home for Christmas and so the last day of my visit my dad and I had an awesome heart to heart and I got to lead him to Jesus um, which was, for me, um, the beginning of restoration that has gone so deep now that it's incredible. Um, but God did that in that moment. And so, excuse me, and so I was here, I worked with the kids, and then we have um, a five-year stint back in the States. And so when the Lord said, I brought you here to fall in love with me, it was really to learn to fall in love with him with all my mind, heart, soul, and spirit and strength as a child with childlike faith because we can intellectually try to do all those things but it's doing it with the childlike posture that he was really requiring and so how many of you know the second part of that is like love your neighbor as yourself right but how many of us i'm going to read a scripture um how many of us immediately think truly that that is just 
love those coworkers, family members, people around us that are nice to us. We tend to bend more towards that part of the mindset of love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So this is this is what the Lord, where the Lord took me for five years. I'm going to read it to you. It's Luke chapter six, verses twenty-seven through thirty-four. But if you will listen, I will say to you, love your enemies and do something wonderful for them in return for their hatred. When someone curses you, bless that person in return. When you are mistreated and harassed by others, accept it as your mission to pray for them. To those who despise you, continue to serve them and minister to them. If, any, if someone takes away your coat, give him as a gift your shirt as well. When someone comes to beg from you, give to that person with what you excuse me, give to that person what you have. When things are wrongly taken from you, do not demand that they be given back. However you wish to be treated by others is how you should treat everyone else. Are you really showing true love by only loving those who love you back? Even those who don't know God will do that. Are you really showing compassion when you do good deeds only to those who do good deeds to you? Even those who don't know the will of God do that. If you lend money to those who only, who only repay you, what credit is it to your character? Even those who don't love God do that. But love your enemies and continue to treat them well. When you lend money, don't despair, even if it's never paid back, for it is not lost. You will receive a rich reward, and you will be known as true children of the Most High God, having his same nature. For your Father is famous for his kindness to heal. I'm going to read that one more time. For your Father is famous for his kindness to heal, even the thankless and the cruel. Show mercy and compassion for others. Just as your heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. So this is heavy. And this is what the next five years of my, look, my life look like. A season of persecution, false accusation. A season of being cursed, reputation at risk, and being mistreated. All to learn to carry the nature of my Father. Because we're talking about unveiled, right? And if we're living lives that are unveiled, guess what that means? It means we're unveiled to show all of his nature whenever he needs it to be shown. And so if I don't have the nature of his mercy on the inside of me because I haven't learned to love my enemies, people are not going to experience the pure, full love of God. Because here's the catch-22 in it. Sometimes we, we get really excited about, oh, we're going to share the love of God. Or we're going to share the nature of God. But I'm going to tell you something. It's going to require sometimes that these things are the things that stretch you into the depths of what that really means. And so, just to be honest with you, I had a job as a family counselor. And I, man, I was like, God, you are really taking me through this process of refining and, and, and truly embedding your nature on the inside of me. But I had um, an MS-13 gang member. How many of you guys are from the MS-13? You've heard of that? It's a huge Latin gang. Yeah. So, one of my... His was MS-13, getting initiated by his brothers, and um, it was very threatening when I would go to their home because I, he was on probation, so I had to report him skipping school and all of those things. Um, and when I did that, um, he threatened me. He said, if I see you out, I'm going to beat you, I'm going to rape you, and I'm going to steal your stuff. I said, okay, Jesus, this is where we are. And I started to look that kid in the face and say, Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. And so I was talking to his mom, talking about going to Walmart one night, and I'm pretty sure it was overheard. Because his brothers and him planned to go that same time, he got a stomach virus and did not get to go with them. And I believe that was nothing but the protection of God on me. But they ended up raping another girl, stealing from her. And you talk about the desire to be enraged, the desire to hate, the desire to, I am telling you, I wanted with everything in me to despise these guys. And so I had way up the ladder, corporate call me and say, well, just never again will you ever have contact with this family. I said, no, 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 no. Bring the mom to my office because I got to pray with her. And I need to let her know I forgive her sons. And we're going to pray for them. And they're like, this is a secular job. I'm like, it is what it is. <laughs> um, but so they, so they allowed her to come in my office. And 
She said, she, I'll never forget, she sat across from me, we grabbed hands, and for about five minutes, our tears spoke all of our words. And we just cried, and I looked at her, and I said, I love you. I said, I love you. I said, and we're gonna pray for your sons. I said, and I forgive them. And I prayed with her, and I never saw, ever, ever saw them again. But I'm gonna tell you how awesome God is, as far as how he will use the moments of embedding his nature in our hearts for us to give the mercy of that away. Fast forward, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I was a missionary in, in Guatemala for two years. And while I was there, one of the people on our team led um, the ringleader of gang and drug um, activity in the city to the Lord. And I was out with him. We were doing street ministry. And I, I looked at him, and I just, I looked at him immediately. He doesn't have a mom in his life. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to pray a mother's prayer over him. And I went over to him and I asked him, I said, did your mom be like, no, I'm adopted, but she's not in my life either. And I just said, this is probably going to sound really weird to you. I said, but can I just hug you and can I just speak a blessing over your life? Um, because mercy, mercy now in me was what was released through me. And so I prayed for him. And I'm telling y'all, 26-year-old man became five in 2.5 seconds. And he wept and he broke. And it was the first time in the midst of all his mess, in the midst of the ungratefulness and all that, that God's kindness came in to heal him. You are awesome. You matter. You are loved. Um, another situation that happened, I, um, for the gospel's sake, was uh, tranquilized and body slammed and put in a cell, literally. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a literal thing. Um, yes, and so I'll never forget the next morning, uh, the cop comes in and he says, um, trembling, please forgive me for what I did, because I'm going to tell y'all honestly what happened that night, and it was, I thought it was a very biblical moment for me, but after they tranquilized me, I said, Holy Spirit, don't let, don't let me fall out to sleep, because I, I confronted a, I confronted a doctor for what he was doing, and they didn't like my confrontation, and so literally, yeah, that was the result, um, but I, I was in, I just said, God, in that moment, I said, I, Lord, I just don't want to fall asleep. I said, and I said it just like this. I said, let me praise you like Paul and Silas did until their things start shaking and hearing the spirit. And I'm telling you to the top of my lungs, praise and worship came out of me until I fell asleep. And when I got up the next morning, because I can tell you, I don't know what happened to me. I suspect there were some things that happened as far as just some mental manipulation, but God restored all of that. Um, but I... The door was unlocked, and I opened the door, and one of the staff came up to me and they said, what happened last night? I said, I don't know. I just praised God and fell asleep. I don't know. They said, um, I said, why is this door unlocked? They said, because the whole shift left because there was a shaking. I said, okay. Okay. Well, I was showed up. That's what happened. And the cop said, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And I just looked at him. I said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And so even in those moments where we know that for the gospel's sake there will be persecution, we have to be okay saying, your nature, God, is to be unveiled in my life. And if this is what unveiling looks like, because we can't, we shouldn't want to just carry a portion of his heart, right? Right? We should want to carry the fullness of his heart because he desires for fullness to be released. And so we can be portion Christians or we can be fullness Christians. But I believe that the Lord wants us to experience his fullness to give away his fullness. Um, and so after that five-year stint, the Lord called me out of that place in the most beautiful way. Um, because what he, what he wanted me to really understand was mercy triumphs over judgment. You can judge something in the spirit, but the person can have mercy in their life. Um, and so that was the thing that, and all of that is what it really came down to is your mercy triumphs over judgment every single time. And so the beginning of 2012, that's where we'll fast forward to, because five years go by and that's where we are now. And I end up in this place with the Lord where I am, it's January and I'm praying and I go up in this vision and in this vision, the Lord shows me this um, this vessel and it's a clay vessel and it is dropped on a table and it shatters and is broken in pieces but the blood of Jesus begins to pour on the table and like a magnet it brings all the pieces 
of this clay vessel back together in, per in perfection, not in perfection, but in the perfection that it was made. And so there's nothing, it looks like a sincere pot of pot that's not been blemished or anything waxed over. And he, the hand, which is, I believe was the hand of the Lord, placed it on a shelf. And when it was time, he got the vase down, he got the, the vessel down, and he poured the nations into it. And I began to weep because the Lord said, this is what your life has looked like. It, it has looked like there was brokenness and the blood of Jesus came and the blood of Jesus sealed everything back together. And when you were in a place of readiness for the next thing I have for you, I could get you down and I could pour into you what I have for you. Now, some of you it might not be nations, but it may be social work. It may be um, your school. It may be friends. It may be family. It may be whatever he's purposed you for. But when I was ready, when I was that that formed clay that he was saying, yeah, I've made her over again. And she sat and she's become um, sturdy. I can pour into her. And so I began to cry. And I, so I began to ask the Lord, Lord, whatever nations you want to pray for this year, just lay them on my heart, God. So for the first month of the year, I prayed for several nations. Um, I worked at hospice at the time. And so um, when I'm not on the field professionally, I'm either counseling or social work. And so I um, was typing up my notes, and all of a sudden, just the Spirit of the Lord um, rose up in me. Um, this mission trip, I'd had a prophetic word spoken over my life in 2008 about nations. And so he brought that word to remember, and he just spoke to me um, something called the world race. And I Googled it, and immediately I was like, oh, God, you're calling me to this. And there were things that I didn't know about it that I shared with you, but I said, okay, God, I'm going to apply. And so I did, and there was a route that I chose, because it's 11 countries, 11 months. Um, and there was a route that I chose that I was like, I really want to go on this route, but it was overcrowded. And so it was funny because the route that I ended up going on, seven of the countries that I've been interceding for were on that route. had no idea what God was doing. I just knew wherever our intimacy leads me, I will follow. And so... End up um, applying for that, end up good getting on onto that squad. Little did I know that the Lord was going to have me leading the squad. Um, and so I watched a video of, of different squad leaders before I ever went to training camp. And the Lord said, I'm calling you to do this. And I'm like, oh, you're just calling me to the trip at first. <laughs> um, but it was awesome because what I, what I sensed him say to me, um, because yes, it was it was again about the nations and about all the people and some of the testimonies that I'm, that I'm going to share. But more than that, it was about me becoming who I already became when He formed me in my mother's womb. And so, what He personally spoke to me was, in leading, you're going to learn to trust me and depend on me in a way you never have before. And I said, okay, all right, because I'm I'm about whatever you're doing with us, I'm about that. And so. I um, prayed and fasted for our team. And how many of you guys know, sometimes it's hard coming together with people you've never met. None of us ever met each other before training camp. I had no history with these people. It was God's hand select all coming together. And we just have to trust whatever he wants to do. Um, what I found out was that it was a backpack, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad. Um, that's what you took with you. Right, your face. I'm a diva, right? That's like hard, right? <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. So that was a stretch for me, but I said, Lord, it's not about me. And sometimes when we want to be unveiled, we gotta we gotta abandon some stuff. We gotta say, I gotta let go of some things. And so that happened, and so I go on a world race, and I remember right before I left, one of the things I said to the Lord. I said, God, I got one bone to pick with you. My grandmother, my dad's mom, and I were extremely close. I said, she was in the hospital right before I left. I said, don't take her while I'm gone because I can't handle it. And so month one, we're on the race. Um, and everything is going okay. And we get to the middle of month one, and my aunt, which is her daughter, died unexpectedly. And I'm like, God, like I'm just starting, really. And I remember him saying to me, I called you here, right? I was like, you gonna stay or are you gonna go back? And, and this is a really hard thing to say right now, but but it's the word and I, it became alive to me. Let the dead bury the dead. It became real. It became real, and I said, all right, okay, God, this is where we're at. And so I that was very unexpected and kind of worked through that. And two weeks later, I get a call that my grandmother has been diagnosed, diagnosed her mom with stage four ovarian cancer. And my granny and I, she would tell anybody out of all her grandchildren, Kelly Renee Surratt is my favorite. And she has no shame in it. And so she told my dad, um, she said, 
Kelly will be so disappointed if she gets back and I'm not here. I'm going to try to hang on. And I said, I said, Daddy, no, no, no. Uh-uh, we're not doing that. And it was crazy because a strength and a grace rose up in me. And I just kind of sat on it for a little bit and prayed. And the Lord said, you're the one that has the grace to release her. You're the only one that has the grace on you to release her. So call her and let her go. And I was like, this is the one thing that I said that we... But there's a grace on you to do it. And so I called her. It was Super Bowl Sunday that year. And I called her and I said, she's in the hospice bed. I said, Granny. I said, it's Kelly. I said, Daddy told me what's going on. I said, but I just want you to know your permission to go. I said, we have had a great life together. I said, you know Jesus? I said, you're tired. And I bless you to transition. I bless you to go. And literally, I'm not kidding, guys. Within the next couple of weeks, she was gone. And I said, God, I said, I can't, I, I didn't feel a release from the Lord to go to her funeral. And that's hard. But I said, what do I need to do to grieve properly? And what do I need to do for you to move in me the way that I need to be moved so I could trust you and stay in where you've called me to be? And it was the, the simplest but most profound thing. He said, write a poem about your grandmother's love and have your mom read it at her funeral. And it's crazy because my parents aren't married anymore. But my mother was still close to her. And so my mother, for that reason, was able to go to the funeral herself. And for her to be the one that read that, it was powerful. She literally called me afterwards. She said, Kelly, I want you to know every one of your aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody said it shifted the atmosphere. So your poem shifted the atmosphere at that funeral. And I'm telling y'all, I had a moment of... I had a moment of, of sitting in grief, and I'm telling you, it was just a moment, but there was a supernatural grace to trust. There was a supernatural grace, and so I continued on month two and, and leading, and in the meantime, we're in Honduras, and there's a baby, and I, until that moment, was not somebody that was like, I want to adopt kids, but I'm telling you, you just needed something in my heart. Um, we were working with a, with a home that took in girls who were gang raped and children who were products of incest. And so there's a little boy there. Um, his grandfather was his father. Um, and so this child didn't speak, didn't let anybody hold him. Immediately when I saw him, I just drew closer. I just felt this draw to him. And it was so beautiful because in that moment, the lady who was over her and her husband said, he doesn't even go to anybody. And I just sat him on my lap and I just prayed a mother's prayer over him. And I shared this story because one of the things that the Lord said to me about his life is he was born on purpose. And his mom had left him at this home. She was trying to raise money to sell him so she could have enough money to get away from, from the area of Honduras. So she wasn't even having to do with her family anymore. Um, but the home had custody of him, which was a great thing. So I found out, this was in 2013, I found out two and a half years later, I get an email update that his mother who, thank you Jesus in that moment, he said, stand in the gap because she can't do this, has come back to get him. She's a believer. She loves Jesus. She's married to a husband who loves Jesus, and she's ready to raise her son. She's ready to raise her son, and I believe that there's power in us standing in the gap. When he asks us to stand for something, to stand for people, he moves and he works. Um, in El Salvador, I'll tell you guys this, because some people I think sometimes get like, I have to be like, Anointed or be like Pastor Dorothy or Pastor Felix or no, yes, anointing is there, but it looks different how it manifests to people, and so you have permission to be you. And so one of the things for me, it's a, it's a crazy word that was given, but there's anointing in my arms and hands when I hug people. It literally there are times when they feel like and they've said, I feel like God just hugged me, and so um, one of the girls who was our translator, she's 21 in El Salvador, and I just. I began to listen to her story, and her mom was not involved in her life, and I told her, I said, I just believe that you just need to sit on my lap, and I just need to hug you. I just need to hug you. And she sat on my lap, and I just hugged her, and she wept and wept and wept, and I let her go, and she said, God just hugged me through you. She says, on the second time I've ever known that God hugged me, she said, but when he was hugging me through you, he restored my peace. She, y'all, I keep in touch with her from time to time. God has transformed her life. Um, because the anointing, it breaks yokes and it lifts burdens. And I believe that for her in that moment, that's exactly what he did. Um, I'm going to share one more story um, from the World Race because I could go down the list, but I have a, I'll have share one more. Um, so I'm in Uganda and I get malaria and pneumonia. 
and a death sentence from the enemy that God said no, the blood's got her. Um, 104.6 temperature. Literally, the doctor says there's really nothing else we can do. The medicine there was not working. Um, the pastor came in to my room and he said, and I at the time was with a team and so I would lay on my bed and I would have team leaders come to the end of my bed and tell me what was going on with their, te with their teams and still just do what God's called me to do because I believe he's my healer, right? And so if we believe something, we're going to continue to move without distraction. When we believe something, we're going to continue to move without distraction. And so I just ended up really saying to the Lord, all right, God, like you got me and you got this. The pastor comes in and he's like, I just want you to know I've been praying for you. And God said, the enemy is trying to kill you, but he cannot. I said, Pastor Solomon, I know. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. And so it was awesome because there was a shift. There was a shift that happened. But I was with some of my girls on the squad. Um, and they, two of them were nurses. And they had an opportunity to work in the labor and delivery floor in the public hospital in Umbarara, Uganda. And so they were like, do you want to come with us? I was like, yes. And so I went with them just to set up real quick of what this hospital looks like. So you have a pre-delivery room, which means unless you're 10 centimeters dilated, you can't come in to push your baby out. And so no water, no Pitocin, no love, just a very cold environment. And these ladies are just piled up on the floor. Um, and so I'm in the labor and delivery room, and it's funny because the midwife is like, can you check the next lady that comes in? I'm like, oh, I can't, no, I can't check. I'm not qualified. But she's like, but you're our training doctor. And I'm like, no. She's like, oh, my God, you have an African twin because you look just like our training doctor. I was like, I'm not her. <laughs> and so I'm not the one. I'm just here to be like, breathe, honey. It's going to be okay. You got this. That, that was what I was there for, straight up. And so I ended up, I ended up um, walking in the room. And I kid you not, guys, there's a bucket with dead babies sitting by the door. So they put the dead babies in this bucket. So as moms are coming in to deliver, this is what they're seeing when they're walking in. And so you talk about a spirit of fear gripping women when they're coming in for birth. Um, and so one of the ladies gets in and a couple have come in and they're having their babies. And one of the ladies comes in and she pushes her baby out and prefaces before I left to go on the water race. I told one of my friends, I said, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to raise a baby from the dead in Africa. Just saying, I just sense it. And she was like, okay. I'm like, same. I'm saying okay too. I don't know. but um, And so this child comes out, not breathing, umbilical cord wrapped around the neck, cut the umbilical cord. The baby's like blue purple. I mean, just awful. They're trying to do, and they have ancient tools, y'all, so they don't have up-to-date medical equipment. And so they're trying to do all that they can. They don't have anything to shock the baby. Um, and so the doctor's just looking and he's like, well, we're done because I can't, we're going to call it. And I'm telling you, the spirit of the Lord rose up on me on, on me, and the, the gift of faith. And I tapped him. I said, I don't know how you feel about this, but I need you to move over because I need to pray. And I told him, I said, Emma, move over. And I just, I had a time lapse moment and I saw this baby's destiny. And I'm telling you, I saw this time lapse of, no, before I formed this baby in this, this baby in this mom's womb, I knew this baby. And so I just went up and we'll say this is the baby. And I laid my head on the baby and I just said, I command life into you in the name of Jesus. I command you to live and not die by the blood of Jesus. And I just lifted my hand up and we all kind of literally are standing there like this looking at the baby. For maybe two minutes, it felt like two. It could have been less, but it definitely felt like two. And all of a sudden you hear this, ah! this cry of this baby. And I'm telling you in that moment, yes, give God glory because he's good. He's good. In that moment, I'm telling you, God said, because that's what it, right? All, all it takes is a breath. He breathed his Ruach into that baby. He breathed his breath of life into that baby. And so for two years, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the water race. I'm in Guatemala working, and um, Spanish is conversational for me, but I was not fluent. And one of the ministries that I really was a part of coming alongside and pushing um, forward was um, a ministry for women in a city called Ciudad Vieja. And so I was there, and um, remember we were having the women over for a retreat, and one of my girls was going to translate for me, who was fluent in Spanish, and I woke up that morning, and Holy Spirit said, Michelle's not allowed to translate for you today. I'm going to give you a fluent tongue of Spanish. <sighs> okay, okay, go tell her, okay. So I'm like, Michelle, 
I just need you to know you're not allowed to translate for me today. And she said, I just need you to know I already knew. <laughs> Glad he talks to both of us. And so we go downstairs, and John chapter 4, the woman at the well, is what the Lord has me ministering and teaching. And it was a very pivotal moment in the ministry. There were about 15 women, 20 at that time in the ministry. Um, but the women who I led with and co-led with were in agreement that we believed that for the city that these women were going to have such an encounter and revelation with the Lord that they were going to go tell their neighbors and their neighbors and their neighbors and there was going to be a city-wide revival and a community-wide revival that began to break out. And so I'm teaching John Chapman, I'm like, about to get up and teach and I'm like, alright Holy Spirit, <laughs> you got this, right? <laughs> I'm not kidding y'all, I didn't miss a beat. I did not miss a beat. Women got saved. Women stood up, shared testimonies about about how God was like healing their minds from abuse, like trauma, like I mean, just crazy. Salvations happened, and all of this happened. And the Lord said to me, "You're going to start doing this frequently. Like, like I'm. This is not just a one-time thing. Like, you're going to teach the gospel, and it's going to flow fluently. And so, this group of women grew from 15 to 20 to 90 to 100." And their families are being ministered to. Their homes are being restored. God is reviving things. And the couple that we partnered with, literally right before the mess, they said, we were, we were almost ready to give up. And I, I want to say this for, this for this group right here. When a shift is about to happen, the pressure is on. But it's because you're breaking forth so that others can break through. And so breaking forth with this group of women all of us together collectively, me saying yes to the Lord, helped us break forth so that they could begin to break through in their marriages, in their homes, in their finances, in their health. So many things. I went back in January for a wedding of one of my dear friends, and I said to Emma, who she is the overseer of the women's ministry, and see you day. I said, I want to get together. I said, I'm going to give you a list of 20 of the moms that I just want to have breakfast with. I just want that intimate time with. And what I didn't know she was going to do when we were there, she said, um, she had all of them. I want you all to share with Kelly how God has changed your life because of the word of God that came forth. Not because of the Kelly that came forth, because of the word of God that came forth. I'm in tears because I'm seeing the fruit of what he did two years ago. I'm seeing the fruit of that. And, and to hear these women speak about how God worked, one of them said, Remember when you did the sermon on the dollar? And it was simple, but it was profound. And I said, yeah. She said, remember when you asked us, what is this? Everybody can say it's a dollar. And I did this to it, and I stomped on it. And every one of the women, when I said, what is this now, said trash. It's a dollar. The value of this thing hasn't changed just because it's crumbled, just because it's stepped on. Life circumstances happen, but guess what? The value of this never changed. Never changed. And so... One of the ladies was sharing with me how God has transformed her thinking about her identity and her worth. And I'm like, Lord, your word doesn't return void. It, it doesn't. He watches over it to perform it. Um, and so moved back to the States um, after that and, and just had a, had a tug of war with the Lord. How many of you sometimes can honestly say, I get in this tug of war between peace and anxiety with God. Like, I want to know what's next sometimes, and he doesn't tell me, and so I try to work it out myself. And I was in one of those moments where I was just like, God, first of all, I didn't really want to be back in the States. There is such turmoil politically here that this atmosphere feels awful. I mean, I was just having a moment about it. And I'm going to tell you, my moment was so bad that I didn't unpack. My, I moved back in October. I didn't unpack my bags till December because that's how determined I was not to stay there. And what the Lord brought me to was so beautiful in that was this. It's Psalm 86, 11, and it says, Teach me more about you, how you work, and how to move, and how you move, so that I can walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. And so I had to choose in that moment, all right, God, you want to teach me some, some things in this season, because guess what? We're never done in God. We're never done. I've been all over the world. I wasn't done. And so he brought me to a place where... I finally said, okay, God, I will apply for a job right here in Morganton, North Carolina, and I will trust you with whatever you want me to do. Um, and I applied, it's funny because I tried to apply for permanent things before, and he only let me get a temporary job because I have other assignments. And so he, um, in the midst of that, I remember 
saying, God, he, he really asked me, what's your, what is the holy ambition that you have for this job? And I said, God, I just, I want to be an instrument of peace at my job. That's what I said. I want to be an instrument of peace. And so I began to pray for the team. I did not know that I'd be on, but I just began to lift them up to the Lord. Um, and so I get the job. I'm on a team of social workers. We do adoption, post-adoption social work. And my office mate, week, week one, says to me, um, I just want you to know that I don't talk a lot. So you might not want to say too much to me. I'm like, oh, I talk. And so if it bothers you, let me know. And it was awesome because three weeks later, she's chatting it up. And she says to me, I know God does things for a reason. And I know he put you in my office, in this office with me for a reason. She said, I don't want to put pressure on you, but I believe, I believe my salvation is contingent upon you being in here. And I said, I speak into that. And I tell you it is because I prayed before I ever got this job for you. I said, I didn't know who the you was, but I prayed. And so what the Lord began to do with our team after that was incredible. He began to open open a door. In a, I work for the county government, secular arena, but he began to open the door for me to one by one build a relationship with my teammates. And my supervisor in supervision at the end of last year said, I just feel like you need to start a Bible study with our team. Okay. Okay. Because God wants to release peace to all the people on this team. So I totally agree with that. And so we have been every Tuesday having, I'm not going to call it Bible study, having an encounter with Jesus. And the women on my team, God is changing their lives. And it's been really awesome because, you know, sometimes we think about work as um, a chore. And we think about secular work as a burden. And we think about it as overwhelming because there's so much darkness. How could I be light in darkness? I am telling you, you carry him, period. That's how. Because you who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this is the glorious transfiguration from which which comes from the Lord who is spirit. I'm sorry, I have one more verse. In Romans 8, 18 says, I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of the glory that is about to be the unveiled, unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. I believe with all my heart that God would say to Journey Ministries to carry my heart fully I need you to live a life unveiled unveiled and I believe that God wants you guys that are here I believe that God wants those who are connected to this ministry I believe with all of my heart that he wants you to carry the fullness of his heart and I believe that he is inviting each and every person into a place of living a life unveiled. Guys, he unveiled, he made public display of the enemy. That's not anything we have to worry about anymore. That's been done. The veil was torn so that we could come boldly before him. That's been done. When we go through things, it's his glory being unveiled in us so that all of creation that is waiting for our revealing can see that unveiling. He's taking us from glory to glory. And the beauty of it all is, before he created us, he knew, he knew who he called us to be. It's a win-win situation with the Lord.